I'm here actually representing uh, Professor Yongli Wager, who is the leader of this particular research project. I wear the project management hat on a number of research projects at Wayne State um, on microplastics, stormwater, green infrastructure, uh, lead in drinking water systems, uh, and volatile organic compounds and their effects on environmental and um, public health. So this particular presentation is on microplastics, but I'd be happy to talk about any of these. So the, the project that, that I've been working on on microplastics is a uh, partnership with many community-based organizations as well as utilities and others. So this is just a list of some of our partners, which include the Ingham Conservation District, the Clinton River Watershed Council, Reroute Pontiac, um, the equipment supplier is N-Wave Optronics, but our funders include um, the National Institute of Health through the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, the Great Lakes Water Authority, which serves four million people, their drinking water in Southeast Michigan. And this particular project is funded by the Great Lakes Protection Fund. So I often tell students to follow the money and understand who's paying for the person who is speaking to you. So I wanted to be transparent and let you know who's, who's funding some of this work. So most people want to know about microplastic pollution. First, what are its sources and causes? What are its effects? What are, what's being done about it, and then what can we as individuals do other than collect all of our plastic bags like the person did in this photo and <laughs> took pictures of it to put online to show just how many plastic bags you can collect in a year. So there's many things that we all can do, some of them anything from social media to changing your actions about microplastics. So I will try to end on a more positive note um, about that at the end. But let's talk about what microplastics actually are first. Um, so micro means, the, uh, by the technical definition, less than five millimeters, and they might be either created intentionally, like microbeads that go into abrasives or, or cosmetics, or the pellets that serve as a feedstock for, um, for plastic manufacturing, but they can be created unintentionally through the degradation or breakdown of larger pieces of plastic. Then nanoplastics, which is a relatively newer term, is those pieces that are down in the one to 1,000 nanometer size, which means that they are basically those larger pieces of microplastic, when those break down, they may be the size of a molecule to a bacteria, let's say. And the key thing about these is that not only are they unintentionally produced, but they have what's called colloidal behavior. If you remember from chemistry, that means they bind to other particles and that gives them the potential to be biologically active. Um, so this is just some examples of the primary microplastics that might be manufactured for the purpose of, of direct use. Most people don't think about it, but latex paint. If you rinse your latex paint out in the nearby stream, you are putting latex plastic out into the environment, maybe abrasives. The most common secondary microplastics actually that we interact with is actually the fibers from our polyester clothing. A lot of our clothing, at least as a mixture of spandex, polyester, other things, that that's the most common microplastic we personally interact with, but our tires from our cars, they leave microplastics out on the road that get washed into waterways. So, these are just some, some you know, visual examples of what I'm talking about. So why are we concerned? I talked a little bit about this, but let me just sort of drive home this point about plastic not being inert, okay? The fact that it carries a negative charge, if you remember from high school chemistry, means that it's going to attract other things that have positive charge. And if you can picture your lead ions or your mercury ions or those other contaminants that others were talking about, those have that positive charge next to that ion, you know? And so your plastic that's out there in the environment with its little negative charges is picking up other things that are attaching to it, okay? And because that microplastic pollution is everywhere and it keeps fragmenting down to molecular size, when that plastic reaches the size of a protein, your body says, aha, that's a protein. I can use that. 
I'm gonna put that right into your heart tissue because that looks like a protein to me. So these little tiny pieces of nanoplastic bound to things like lead and mercury and the various other metabolites of other contaminants like PCBs, those can interact with our own internal biology and go into our tissue. They don't just go, you know, if we ingest a microplastic, it doesn't just pass through our digestive system. We put it into our tissues, okay? And then other animals that are out there in the environment, the fish that's in the waterway that has the microplastic in it, when we eat those fish, the fish also have those microplastics in their tissues and we're also consuming those. So it's part of not only the environmental food web, but our own personal food web as well. So what does that mean? Well, what is plastic really? I didn't think about it too much until I started doing this project, but how many of you have thought about the fact that plastic is oil? Okay, good. Plastic is oil. It's 90, 99% of your plastic bottle that your laundry detergent came in, 99% of that came from either a barrel of oil or actually in the US it's much more common to, for it to come from natural gas. So, you know, all the, the, the massive increase in the fracking industry that we've seen in the last, you know, decade or so, a lot of that is fueling plastic packaging. And, you know, we, we see all this about the polymers, the different polymer numbers. There's, you know, a, a small amount of the plastic that is maybe additives that are added for color or to make it stretchy or this or that. But it really is basically fossil fuel. Um, how, I'm sorry these graphs are sort of small. I probably can't see them. But um, basically, this graph just sort of shows the, um, the environmental increase uh, or the, the amount of manufacturing increase. This is 1950 here. This is 2019. So the, the number of million, we went from producing basically zero tons of plastic in 1950 to about 400 million tons in today um, in global plastics production. And the vast majority of that is packaging. Um, some of it's, this is textiles, this is other sectors, this is other consumer product, products, you know, the, the tip of this, this microphone here, that's a plastic foam, the formica countertop of this desk, that's plastic. So that's sort of the, you know, the consumer and institutional products is about there. We have a lot of plastics in our automobiles, which, which is good, right? We're not using as much energy to move a car around as we did in the 1950s because our cars weigh a lot less, right? So there are good sides of plastic as well. The plastic um, food wrap protects our food so that we don't have as much food spoilage as we did in the 1960s. And food waste is number one of the number one reasons why we have climate change right now is because of the amount of energy it takes to grow food and then the food waste. So I'm not saying that plastic overall is bad. There are some very good uses for plastic, but this is the waste that generated. And I think the really interesting piece is this bottom one, which we see a tiny, tiny bit of the trimmings from industrial machinery. So the amount of gain that we can get by being efficient in how we manage our excess plastics, that's not at the, at the plastic company. That's not at the company that trims these pieces of microplastics to make the surfaces on the desk. That's not where the big gain is, right? We can see from the data that the big gain is where we have massive amounts of waste and things like packaging. So, Microplastics are found literally everywhere. I always alluded to this, but these are the actual scientific studies that show that you know, human, human waste is being examined for microplastics and we are finding it there, along with literally every place else. Air, soil, bodies of animals, drinking water, taps. So as many of you have observed, since we live so close to the water here, my, plastics float. That's how they get around, right? And, it's, um, you probably can't see it because of the desk, but there's, there's a difference in the different types of plastics and how much they float. So at the top here, polypropylene floats the most. It's about the same as like plastic bags, polyethylene, polystyrene. And that's interesting because basically you think about polystyrene, styrofoam, those big you know, floats that get used for, for docks and things like that. Well, plastic bags, 
the, the substance itself, it floats as much as styrene does, really. Styrofoam gets a bad rep, but the polyethylene floats just as much, as do the laundry jugs and the bottle caps and all these other things. Um, then, you, going down the list, you have other things that, that float slightly less, like cigarette fil uh, filters and, and um, the fibers, uh, fishing nets. Um, the, I think that this graphic, I don't 100% agree with everything here. While it is true that you'll, you're going to tend to see the PET in the sediment, and we are now part of the Anthropocene fossil record because the people that are out there st sampling sediment cores, they are finding that we are leaving our mark on the fossil record because of those, um, those PET bottles that end up in the sediment. <laughs> But PET is also used in clothing, and so once it's in a fiber form, there's a certain buoyancy that's re-contributed to those plastics. And so the fact that they float means that they stay in suspension in the water column, and that renews their potential to expose us and other animals over and over and over again, right? They don't just... Tire, even though tires may be contributing a substantial amount of rubber into the environment because of their wear, the rubber doesn't float. It goes into the sediment relatively quickly and it doesn't get resuspended like the other things are. So these ones that carry the negative charge and grab the, the, the toxic ions, these are the ones that are actually more of a problem for us. And because they're part of the consumer waste stream, that's that's why they're as much of a concern as they are. So that, that's kind of all making sense. Yeah, I, I didn't know any of this before I started doing this project. So it, it's, it's, I think it's relatively new information. It's great to hear that it's getting into places like the New York Times. But understanding the principles of why it matters are really essential. This diagram just shows there's a lot of ways for those microplastics to not only get into the environment, but then keep getting recirculated in the environment. The person who loses their fishing gear, it may go downstream, it may end up in the drinking water system because downstream you may have another, you may have drinking water inputs. I'm not sure if that's even shown on this, but many communities get drinking water out of their local rivers. Um, and then the wastewater treatment plant, because many of our wastewater treatment systems are based on technology from the 1940s and 50s still, their, their mechanisms for removing the microplastics because they get resuspended. We have a sedimentation process in wastewater treatment, but it's not designed to grab, you know, molecular-sized microplastics, right? So, our um, those pathway, those many pathways in the environment result in many opportunities for us to ingest microplastics. So studies have shown that um, treated drinking water can have 300 to 500 particles per liter. Um, Salts that you get, you know, for nice sea salt that sounds so natural may, is actually one of the major sources of, of microplastics that we see in packaged food. Um, but the fibers from our polyester clothing are the vast majority of what we experience. So the dust that comes off of our polyester clothes, we may breathe them in. We're finding them in, in people's lung tissue and then in the wash water afterwards it can get... Um, into the wash water, and uh, I'll, I'll talk in a little. I, have, I brought some examples of mitigating um, things in the in the section where I talk about what we can do. So this the science is really the the number of articles about microplastics has just has similar to the growth of, of plastics themselves. It's grown exponentially in just maybe the last ten years. It's a very new area of science, and we're still trying to figure where all of this falls out as to where the greatest risk of exposure is and the greatest potential for making a difference. But let's talk about some of the, um, the studied effects of ingestion, the people that are doing studies in the laboratory on models that, uh, you know, either mouse or fish models. These are animals that have been proven through many years of studies to, to, because they share so much of their DNA with humans, we know exactly how to extrapolate from a fish study into what we think that does in humans. So this is a study of zebrafish by one of my colleagues um, who was at Wayne State and is now at the University of Florida. But in an experimental study, she used fluorescent polystyrene and she grew zebrafish in, in, um, in uh, fluorescent polystyrene. And so this is the zero parts per billion, um, the, the control level 
zebrafish, and then increasing from 10 to 100 to 1,000 to 10,000 parts per billion of, um, of polystyrene exposure. And you can see how the animal is, um, is inserting that polystyrene into its tissue. Um, and, and it's a dosage-dependent response. So the more pl microplastics you ingest, the more you're going to have it in your tissues. Um, so it's been proven that it crosses the gut barrier into your tissue. It can accumulate in your tissues and organs, particularly for humans and lungs, as I mentioned. Um, when it's there in your gut, it can just perturb the microbiome because we, as we now know, we, are, we have many, many beneficial um, bacteria that, that are part of our gut microbiome, and so those organisms can be negatively affected by the, the micro and nanoplastics. And this induces inflammation, neurodegeneration, motor dysfunction. And interestingly, when you're studying zebrafish, you can look at them, um, and, and they're still alive. They have this, um, you know, this, uh, uh, you know, these are sublethal effects. Uh, they're, these are these uh, the effects of microplastics. They're not killing them. They're just treating these nanoplastics as if they're they're proteins and putting them into their cells. So you can observe them in the lab and see that they're hyperactive. They're experiencing behavioral effects that are sublethal. So there, it makes you wonder what, at what level that happens. So the, like I said, the research is still just happening right now. Um, and as I mentioned before, it's, we're still trying to figure out to what degree these microplastics carrying the, these persistent organic pollutants and metals into our systems, we're still working to figure out how that affects us. Um, but some studies have, have um, shown that adults, American adults, consume and inhale about 94,000 to 113,000 particles per year. And like I said, 99% of that is um, particles off of our polyester clothes. Not just polyester, but other clothing. So what are we doing for testing, um, given the concern about this, right? You know, it's a contaminant. We know now know it's a contaminant. What are we doing? Well. The challenge is that because it's so new, we're still trying to develop test methods. And I think as the, you know, as the Love Canal case that we just observed it um, shows, it can take a long time for the science to catch up with noticing that there's a problem, right? We're just noticing there's a problem. And so we, we are still underway with test method development. But there are many, many groups that are working on this. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, the United States Geological Survey, ASTM International, which sort of sets standards across industries. The state of California has just passed legislation that microplastics must be monitored in communities above a certain size for uh, what's in the drinking water. So by virtue of requiring monitoring, the state of California is pushing the entire industry towards figuring out these test methods. So regulation, you may not be in a position yet to regulate a standard for a quantity in drinking water that's safe, but you can regulate to say, yes, we should require this. We should require, if we are providing public drinking water, we should at least be able to tell people we know what they are getting. But we're, even some of the science that was done 10 years ago, many of the uh, pieces of equipment that's used St you know, as a very standard basis is, you know, pl plastic tubing and plastic this and plastic that. So even coming up with the right equipment to be able to, to collect the water, even, even the glass jars typically have a plastic lining on the inside of the cap to keep there be from being water leakage from out of your sample, right? So even just having the right equipment to be able to objectively test all this stuff, we're, we're just not there yet. But we're working on it. It takes many, many scientists committing a lot of time to, um, to, to start working on getting systematic facts documented. But once the test methods get developed, then we'll be detect, you know, working to detect and monitor, figure out the right monitoring system. How do you get enough samples to, with statistical certainty to say how much microplastics is in there? And then we can start evaluating for treatment and removal of this. So obviously the challenges of this are that it's very time consuming, labor intensive, it's difficult to detect these very small micro or nanoplastics which are down at the size of bacteria to protein level size 
And because of the small size, it's very easy to underestimate those small particle quantities. So there are also a lot of uncertainties, particularly from an environmental sample where you may have sediments and other things in the sample in addition to microplastics, and the separation of things is very difficult at that level. But we're working on it. No standardized system of measurement yet, um, but it's important to remember that even studies that just look at macroplastics, because people have been cross comparing the amount of macroplastics observed, like you know, sandals that you find on the beach and you know, leftover tubs and containers you find on the beach, they're finding that that is directly correlated with the number of small particles. You can sometimes use the big pieces that you collect as being representative of the, what you think you might be there in terms of the small pieces. So even big scale litter collection, you know, community science types of studies are, are um, providing very interesting data when it comes to this because you can infer from the large pieces how many small particles might you have. So what can we do together to break this cycle? This slide is deliberately very confusing and disorienting because it is really hard to know what, where your action could best be spent. You know, how to, you know, are you, should be you, you thinking about, you know, when at the point of purchase, should I be buying this tabletop that has a plastic surface on it or should I be buying an all natural wicker table should, you know, do, do I want to think about how it's going to last? Because this thing, even though it's plastic, it's going to last a, long, a lot longer than that thing that's natural. It's hard even at the level of the purchasing decision. Do I really need this? Is this an elective purchase? Is it sustainable? Is there hidden waste? If I, if I order it from someplace, how much hidden packaging is going to come along with that item that I order from online? How much hidden packaging did the store waste? Is the store I'm buying from wasting all kinds of plastic packaging behind the scenes that I don't even see, right? That's very chronic in, in um, restaurants and in other industries where you don't see what happens behind the scene. There might be all kinds of hidden things happening just at the level of purchasing, right? So that's the top tier. Then once you've actually decided to purchase something up at the top level, well, you know, how, how do I use it to extend its life? How do I repair it maybe to keep it going instead of buying the next thing? Um, can I recycle it? A lot of plastic, they, they say, oh, recycle your plastic, but you're not actually recycling it indefinitely into the same product. Like glass, you can break it down since it's basically just melted sand, melted silica. You can break glass down indefinitely and recycle it into a glass bottle indefinitely. Whereas plastic, because it is this complex polymer forma, formula, and because it gets mixed with so many other things in the meantime, other plastics, <coughs> dirt, the paper label, all these other things, it's usually what, they, what we call downcycled, where the plastic becomes you know, it might be recycled into a slightly lower quality product, like from a plastic bottle, which is very clean, you know, your plastic bottle for your milk, that might get downcycled into a piece of lawn furniture or something like that. But when you're done with it as lawn furniture, a lot of recycling systems say, no, you can't recycle your lawn furniture because that could have anything in it. It could have rubber, it could have, you know, metal attachments, it could have multiple different kinds of plastics. So a lot of plastics actually end up, they're, they're destined for the landfill the moment that they are manufactured. And then when you finally have it at the end of its life, you know, once you've used it up, worn it out, um, you've either made do without something new or you've done without it, um, then you have to think about what, what is the most environmentally sensitive way to dispose of it. Can it be repurposed? Um, is there some kind of alternative to disposal? Um, so as you might have noticed, like thinking about this for yourself, you're, you're not just sometimes thinking about this for yourself. You're thinking about it for your kids, for your family. You're making decisions for your, that affect your neighborhood, your job, your workplace. So these are very, very difficult, big decisions that, 
that we all have to support each other to make. Because in a lot of workplaces, if you're going to spend five extra minutes talk, thinking or talking about something, you're wasting the company's money. And so as a culture, these are all tough decisions that supporting each other to make these decisions is one of the key things we can do. And we have to acknowledge that it's tough, that there are many, many different levels on which to make these decisions. So those require group collective thinking and support. Um, individually, though, we can, we can feel supported and we can feel like we're making a difference by doing specific things. So I brought some examples of specific things that we can do. Um, what, on the purchasing decision, I actually recently bought a phone case that not only was pa packaged entirely in paper, but it is a compostable food, uh, phone case. It is made out of a cornstarch-based plastic. Now, I don't know for certain that this company didn't use some toxic chemicals in the process of extracting the cornstarch, and certainly the cornstarch itself was grown through the use of petrochemicals because most corn can't grow unless you have fertilizer inputs, you know, which requires natural gas that goes into the nitrogen and all these other things. But there, you know, I, I bought a. Um, a computer mouse recently that was entirely in, uh, in paper packaging. So it's possible to find more and more companies that are packaging entirely in paper so that you don't end up with a plastic waste just when you buy things. Um, and then for the microfibers, there, this is a, um, the, the uh, packaging for a guppy friend washing bag. But actually, um, so I brought an example of a guppy friend washing bag. It is somewhat ironic that it is made out of um, polyester, but it reduces the friction on your clothing so that when you put your big fuzzy um, fleece jacket into this and you wash this, it reduces the friction so that fewer microfibers come off in the first place. So if you already have microfiber clothing and you're not going to get rid of it, <coughs> reducing the friction helps. If you have something that's really falling apart badly, it will catch the microplastics in this and then you can safely dispose of them in the trash. Um, I actually realized, I didn't grab my guppy friend bag, but this you can also use if, you're, um, if your relatives have old slips and you are a sewer, you can sew a zipper into an old slip and you can use that. So this is, that's what this is. Um, and then there's this Cora Friend um, uh, washing ball, or Cora ball, which similarly ironic, it is made out of plastic as well, but it has these little um, uh, scrubby uh, things on it that if you wash it with your laundry, that will trap the, the, the loose microplastics and then occasionally you can, you can um, de, um, depillify it into your trash and that too is another strategy. So there are, there are more washing devices for doing your wash. There's all the other reduce, reuse sorts of suggestions for shopping or on the go to avoid plastics. There's even just thinking about the product to packaging ratio. Like I'm on a mission, I haven't convinced my family yet, but I'm on a mission to get my family to say no to the dentist when the dentist offers you a little tiny package of toothpaste which has a tiny bit of product and a whole lot of packaging around it. That's why buying it in bulk is better from an environmental standpoint because your ratio of product to packaging goes up a whole lot. So there's a lot of ways to do just in your choice of what you buy, what kind of packaging you choose where you can feel like you're making a positive difference. And you are making a positive difference, but that, that entire picture of how much packaging we have, we have a flood of packaging in our society, and a lot of us don't even see it because it happens behind the scenes at the stores themselves in the, in the, in the behind areas that we don't interact with. Um, so that's why there are collective actions um, that are legislative and, regulate, and, and regulatory in scope because when, it's the, when the labor time to, to, to not waste things is going to cost money, then that requires a public investment in reducing that cost. So you have plastic bag bans in, in several states. Um, there may be more uh, than this on this list. Uh, this slide's a little dated. Um, the Federal Break Free from Plastic Act has been uh, introduced in several sessions of Congress. I don't know where that stands right now, but um, that would recreate markets for plastic recycling so that even though plastic packaging seems to be something that we're not going to quit anytime soon, it would create markets so that more recycling happens. 
Um, the expansion of the Michigan bottle return law has been introduced in several sessions of the Michigan legislature. I don't know where that stands either. Um, but this 2022 California ballot initiative, um, that would shift some of those cleanup costs to the producers, and that would actually make some of the people that are generating the packaging problem in the first place be the ones that help clean it up instead of communities that are stuck with the waste after, after um, materials get purchased. And as I mentioned before, the, um, the, um, the public drinking water uh, monitoring for microplastics is starting this fall in California. Um, globally, of course, this is a big, big issue because of how many communities are along our coasts and, and along our oceans and are being affected by the, um, by the plastics in the ocean. So global plastic treaty dialogues have been happening for several years and so there's some hope that on an international, there may be enough international pressure that there will be international action that gets taken sometime soon as well. So these are some of the reasons to reduce use overall and I know that um, uh, the previous speaker mentioned the um, the uh, rail, the derailment in East Palestine, Ohio, uh, with the, uh, the many, many cars of uh, polyvinyl chloride that derailed there, and the, uh, the potential long-term effect is interesting to me in this aerial photo. You can see it looks much like you know, many communities around here where you have you know, lakes, connected by streams that go right through here. And so the, ter the, the type of long-term concerns from these sorts of major events are significant. And, but even the, the human health cost of being next to the manufacturing plants that produced the chemicals that were in the rail car in the first place. This is a picture of a, um, a factory explosion and fire in 2005. And the communities that, you know, there's, there's houses right here. So there's communities nearby. This is, a, is this really a justice concern for the communities that are around these plants? You know, do we want this as part of our society for people to, who are disadvantaged to be experiencing the burdens of these types of accidents, um, given that we can't yet control the effect on public health of these things? Um, and then out in the ocean, uh, the fishing line and the other, um, actually, I, I, I shouldn't really put too much on the fishing line, because actually the, the, the great, um, uh, this is the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, which is one of the largest. There's five places where the ocean currents cause plastics to create islands in the oceans. Um, but overall, in those giant floating garbage patches, 80% of the mass is land-based plastic. So 80% of that plastic originated from land. It's not escaped fishing line. They, they think that the, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch maybe has a higher percentage just because of where the major fishing industries are in you know, Thailand and China and Japan and those, um, those nations that do a lot of fishing in the Pacific, that a lot of that is fishing line, but the majority of the, the plastic waste in the ocean is land-based originally. So all of these things really are you know, reasons why we should be thinking about reducing overall use because of where it's manufactured as well as where it ends up. Um, and, and the related industries, like how was your, how was your fish raised? Do, we, do you know? Was it in a you know was it in an aquaculture system that involved nets out in the ocean or was it something else you know that we as informed consumers we could be asking those questions and making sure that um, that all of our consumption decisions factor into sustainable practices. Um, so just to talk a little bit more about what Wayne State University is doing. Um, our project is called the Smart Management of Microplastics Pollution in the Great Lakes. And so we started by establishing a network of collaborators, including the water utilities, not only the drinking water, but the wastewater utilities, uh, community organizations and universities to figure out where our researchers' efforts could best be applied. And as a result of that, we, we partnered with some community organizations to, to design green stormwater infrastructure. So this is some um, green stormwater infrastructure in the city of Pontiac that collects road runoff 
and actually is designed to get the plastics off of the road and then volunteers take the plastics out of the green infrastructure before the green infrastructure goes straight into the storm drain that goes into the river that goes into the Great Lakes. And so it's trying to look and see to what degree is green storm infrastructure a useful tool this way to keep plastics from going into waterways where they might then become the water intake for the next neighboring communities. Um, similarly, volunteer work days to collect plastics. But then our, um, our sensing system, this is using a, um, a laser detection device that um, we've developed a, a flow through system so that, um, and this is still in the testing phase, but um, by, by, t by testing water you know, on a flow through basis, you can maybe have an early detection rapid response sort of uh, situation if you were, let's say, upstream of a drinking water plant. You could change how the drinking water intake is working so that you're not putting a big surge of microplastics, you know, maybe after a storm or as a result of an industrial release or a problem in a landfill. Um, so we're still working on that and then we've been developing school curriculum and working with some um, uh, school age, middle school to high school age kids to see what kinds of curriculum work about microplastics. Um, and the, let's see, uh, some of the products of this work, working with our community groups, is that um, they, uh, we actually had a student group that, that came up with some memes that were really, um, uh, that meant a lot to the kids that were working on them. So, uh, did you, do you know that you consume enough plastic every week to make a credit card? I'm not sure if that's true. There was a study that showed that. I'm not sure if that's universally true, but it just, it's a meme that caught on. And so just getting to think about like, what does that actually mean? If you're actually consuming plastic, what, you know, what are some ways to um, relate to that? Or just calling out the fleece jacket as, you know, those, the, the 250,000 microfibers that get shed in a single wash that um, that those are fibers that you may also be breathing in while you're wearing it. Think about that. So these fact sheets are online as, as are a number of educational videos for others to use. So we've posted the, all of those on our, um, on our website, which, it, which I hope I put on here. Hmm. I think I had it on the last one. It was up at the top. Microplastics.wayne.edu. So that's our website. Um, and we'll be adding more things as we go, including um, the microplastics data library. So the, um, the Raman, and I'm not going into the details about what Raman spectra is, but when you do this, this um, laser-based spectroscopy on the microplastic samples, you get a very unique signature for, based on plastic type. And so those things can be used for fingerprinting to figure out where that plastic came from. So particularly if it's industry-based or if it's based you know, on a particular uh, business that maybe isn't managing its plastic waste appropriately and it's ending up out in the environment, there will be a data library so that other people that are collecting data, these, these instruments, they're a little bit expensive, but if a consortium is sharing an instrument, um, it might be reasonable for many community organizations to collect these, um, these images of what's in your water. Um, in terms of microplastics, so we're designing a data library to, um, to help people to identify their, their plastics from the raw spectrum. Um, helping with plastic product life cycle analysis, there's a lot of different sources and sinks for plastics in various communities based on industries, and some of that can be figured out from national data. So we'll be posting some more things on that, as well as continuing to test our sensor. Um, along with the University of Alabama and the United States Geological Survey, uh, continuing to do stakeholder outreach, and then hoping to eventually increase microplastic monitoring and improve Great Lakes water quality. So thanks very much for listening.